Um, our uh, almost final speaker of the day, another medical doctor kind of gone awry, originally a dentist, now the CEO of the Youth Employment Service, YES, a joint initiative between business, labor, and government, which addresses South Africa's youth unemployment challenge by creating one million work experiences in South Africa. Uh, she's founded Boundless World, which focuses on strategy and innovation, inclusive business models, mobile digital skills, economic and behavioral research. She's a PhD fellow from Maastricht uh, in the adjunct facility at Gibbs. So all the credit you can imagine, Tashmir Ismail Seville talking to us today about innovative thinking to create jobs for the youth in South Africa. Why don't you give Tashmir a big round of applause. There you go, Tashmir, thank you. Hi. Hi. No, I, you know when you recognize a face, I just, uh, the TV doctor, hey? <laughs> Just a doctor. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. Uh, Tashmir Ismail Saville, the CEO of the Youth Employment Service. I'm thrilled to be able to share a little bit about YES to audiences because we've been working on this program for close to a year and a half now. Um, so we started negotiations with uh, the DTI, the Department of Labor Presidency, around March or April last year. And um, the, the purpose of these negotiations was to be able to build a big national initiative around employment creation. So this is the Youth Employment Service. We talk about a future that works, uh, both for South Africa and for youth. We call ourselves an economic enabler. This idea of uh, youth employment became quite critical. If you take yourselves back um, to the dark days two years ago when we were facing downgrades, you'll remember that there was this big fear that the ratings agencies were going to come, downgrade us, and there would be all these economic consequences. And of course, we know how that story ended. But at the time, uh, Business South Africa went to the finance minister uh, Minister Gordon at the time, before the revolving door at the finance ministry started to, to kick in, and said, you know, these downgrades are going to have dramatic impacts on everybody. And in his true pragmatic fashion, said to Business South Africa, so what are you going to do? And this was where the CEO initiative was birthed. So we are an initiative which has come from the CEO initiative, which is Business South Africa's commitment to government that there would be collaborative projects to uh, attend to what we call the wicked, hairy problems that South Africa faces. And of course, youth unemployment is, is one of those big ones. So we are business-led. We received no funding from government. But what we did get, which is very exciting after a long period of negotiation, was on the BE scorecard. There's been a move by the DTI to take BE down to a very broad base and allow YES to confer two companies that assist in creating jobs a recognition, which is a level move on the scorecard. So that is the, the government contribution uh, towards the Youth Employment Service. We were um, partially launched. I say partially launched because the DTI Gazette was not published on this date in uh, March, the 28th of March. We found out we were launching when the president was reading his sonar <laughs> and discovered, oh, we're launching in, in March, um, a few months ahead of schedule. We managed to pull it off, and uh, here in this picture, you'll see my co-convener, Stephen Kossif, who's very operationally involved in the program, and Colin Coleman. And there I am hiding behind um, Jabu Mabuza's shiny head. <laughs> so when you look at youth unemployment um, in South Africa, it's, it's hard not to get overwhelmed by the size of the problem. Uh, there's talk of the Million Jobs Initiative, but there simply are not one million jobs sitting in the freezer in the back. Every job has to be built, and it has to be built in an environment and in an economy that is not created for job creation at entry level. These structural realities the spatial issues, the legacies of apartheid planning. I've been going to townships for the past 10 years, and things have been getting harder and harder, not easier. 
to get to an entry-level job if you happen to live in a township that is reasonably close to our centers of economic growth can cost up to a third of that entry-level salary. Because Gauteng generates close to 90% of the GDP of the country, you find that you leave those areas of concentrated economic activity and the rest is just flatline. And so you get this exodus of people from communities around the country leaving their children, their families, often brick dwellings behind, to live a very poor quality of life in the city. Where today children are nutritionally stunted. We live in a country where over 50% of people live on under 524 rand a month. And yet, on the other side is this incredible wealth. We have the highest Gini coefficient in the world. We are the most unequal country in the world. And so to try to create jobs when you have such high inequality becomes difficult. And this problem is big. Six million of South Africa's youth are not in employment, education, or training. So it makes the inequality makes our unemployment different to Spanish unemployment or South Korean unemployment. Because these are youth that ho don't have anywhere to go. They wake up in the morning and they're trapped in an environment with no economic pathways. Now, we have a lot of money that is being spent by the state. 87 billion of our fiscus, ladies and gentlemen, is spent on higher education and training. And the problem is not grad unemployment. Grad unemployment is below 11%. Okay? It's just that they all have Twitter and a flair for drama. So we think this is the biggest problem. The biggest problem are young people that don't have matric certificates. This doesn't mean that they don't have capabilities. Not having a matric certificate means that most likely your social situation stopped you from getting the matric certificate. This wasn't part of my talk, but I'm actually going to point her out to you to make this point. This young lady over here, who just by chance ended up in front of the president, her name's Homozo. Homozo lives in Alex. Um, we've built a business literacy program on digital called Siazakela. We did it for Unilever. And we use coaches on the ground in addition to the mobile, the digital modules. And to select our coaches, we have an app called NAC, built by Harvard PhD. It's used all over the world. But it uses gamification with three games to build a detailed psychographic profile of someone. Problem solving, creativity, uh, ability to do STEM subjects, attitudes, things like grit. Komotsu has a crappy metric certificate. She won't mind me telling you. But she scored in the top percentile globally, globally. Out of a cohort of 40 that we tested in Alex and Dipsluert, three of our cohort tested in the top percentile globally. All of whom are trapped and stuck with no, stuck, stuck, stuck with no pathways in their community. So she's now a Yes Youth, one of our first placements. So unfortunately, that 87 billion of the fiscus that goes to universities, TVET colleges, and CETAs doesn't reach the Komotsos of this world. It's actually an elite fund for people with good matric that can get access to those facilities. And so a big part of yes is those people with a poor matric, those people with no matric, no matric is 44% of the unemployed. How do we start going into their communities? This is 67% of youth are not in employment, guys. In townships, 60% of the country's unemployed reside. What this means is if you're the employed person, you're the weirdo on the block. You're the outlier, you are not the norm. If you are unemployed, you are the norm. What does this say for the role models that are left in communities? This number is scary, and it's getting worse. Stats SA just released the latest figures. So to summarize this, this environment that we're trying to build jobs in, which is not Yes's job, and it's not the government's job, it's all of ours, because this problem will engulf South Africa. We have a large supply of youth. They are spatially distant from where the opportunities are and where the money is spent. 
And this world, the Santons, the Houtings, the centers, the economic centers, are shrinking in terms of jobs. They can get more profitable, but they get more profitable with efficiencies and algorithms. They don't get more profitable with headcount. And so this is the world that we face. So the job of yes is, can we find new places? Can we find new spaces? Can we find new industries and new career pathways? The exciting thing that we're discovering is even though fourth industrial is disintermediating at the top end of the pyramid, it is opening up in communities a whole range of jobs that didn't exist 10 or 15 years ago. There's a tiny call center up in Hazyview. It was started as a CSR project by T-Systems. They had unemployed youth that they'd taken through a career program, but there's up in Mpumalanga, Bushbuck Ridge area, unemployment for women is 73%. And this little NGO started the call center with T-Systems. One day, one week, taxi strike in Joburg. None of the T-Systems people can get to the call center in Johannesburg. T-Systems phones Hazy, Hazy View office. Guys, we're routing everything to your little office. Great excitement in Hazy View. Oh my God, what are we going to do? And guess what? They shoot the lights out. They do a better job, better ratings, and 20% cheaper. T-System phones back. Guys, we're keeping all those contracts at your Hazy View office. They now do man trucks. Um, console Glass, uh, Fiat Chrysler, Transnet, uh, the two other big multinationals, and T-Systems own. This tiny little office. Why? Because we've now got virtual highways. Technology, data has allowed us to locate and create economic centers outside of the traditional. And that's what we mean when we say new places, spaces, faces, industries, and career pathways. And many of these jobs don't require metric. So what YES has done is we've said to corporates, take as many people as you can into your shopping centers, your head offices, your branches. But whatever you can't put there, if we take Standard Bank, for example, their YES target is close to 4,000 jobs. So we are Standard Bank going to place these youth and pay for these youth in small businesses, in SMEs, in township communities, in Bushbuck Ridge, closer to rural communities and where we find economic opportunity. And we're starting all new micro enterprises. So what we know is that small business is the answer to economic growth. I'll give you some numbers. Um, oh, the numbers come later. Can I skip forward and back again? Okay, I've taken my numbers out. I'll tell you then. In Europe, 1% of all firms are over 250 employees. 1% across the whole of Europe. 91% of firms are 1 to 8 employees. You'll find the same numbers, similar numbers in the States. So economies are not led and driven by large corporates. It's small business. In South Africa, small business is 56, 50 to 60% of GDP and jobs creation. So that's our answer. Our answer is how do we drive a whole lot more small business, but not the micro enterprises at subsistence level. Small business that adopts technology so that the output and value is greater. So that the mom and pop store with one or two people is moving to eight people. But it's the power of the volume, of the scale that we can use. So we identify value chains and we look for market access first. Who will invest, who will buy? And then we build training and SMEs. To do this, we have what we call our Yes Hubs. They unlock value in our value chain. The Yes Hubs are multi-purpose, multifunctional. If there's a value chain that is looking to create digital tourist experiences online, the hub in that, like the one we're going to do in, in uh, Bushbuck Ridge, because we're going to be uh, building offtake agreements with multinationals like Amadeus, with Sabi, Singita. So everything that we create there is to unlock what we call the wildlife economy. So it's digita uh, digital experiences, chefs, the Swiss embassy, uh, and the Swiss ambassador is giving us Swiss hotel experience apprenticeships. 
and we'll take that world-class knowledge and best practice and drive it through these facilities into local communities to raise their standards. But we have the market access first, so it's not training for training's sake. And this, of course, feeds into all the small businesses in the community. It acts as a reservoir of that knowledge. This is a facility we launched in Tembisa a month ago. Uh, this facility has a hydroponics farm uh, that trains people in hydroponics so we can start turning consumers into producers. Nutritional stunting in townships can be addressed. AFRI is going to be building aquaponics and hydroponics facilities for us. This means fish and omegas in landlocked communities. So the way we encourage jobs, the style of jobs we encourage have spillover in numerous ways. So the way for companies to get involved, and I'm hoping that people in this room will be contacting YES to say, we will help you build jobs, or we will contribute to enterprise development for your YES hubs, we will contribute skills development either by giving of your time and passing on your skills to someone, um, or through your BE scorecard, socioeconomic development funds to assist with the infrastructure, or just plain grants. And we're going out to Business South Africa and saying this is everyone's job. There's no way we can create the number of jobs this economy needs as either government or a little youth employment service or as big corporate. It takes businesses of all sizes. We're also asking that the billions, the billions our country spends on BE, that this starts to get used as an innovation fund to experiment in for-profit models that drive inclusive growth. Can we start using it more cleverly, cleverly rather than as compliance? And I was asked to do just a tiny bit on innovation. One of the questions that we ask companies when, when we tell them to think about building inclusive growth models is to think about their world differently. When we ask you to think about solutions for the country, can we ask that you not go straight from problem to solution with your Bob the Builder tool belt that you've got? And say, this is how I always do it. Because we know that definition of insanity. And as a country, we keep doing the same things over and over again and expecting a different result. The only way to address the massive socioeconomic challenges we have is if we start to apply some creativity and do this a little differently. So we're saying take a walk on the wild side. Think in an abstract way. How can I do this differently? How do I think about my problem as an opportunity area? How do I pivot and reframe? Instead of seeing townships as a blight on the landscape, can we start to think about this as a space with incredible potential? The homozos of this world are our country's balance sheet. And they're sitting in these communities waiting for you, the privileged, to unlock what they have to offer. And there have been incredible innovations that we take for granted today, but that really changed the face of our continent. I'll just show you some of this. I just assembled a few examples for you to show how possible it is with small changes to make big impact. This is a graph that shows the number of users per 100 people in an economy. Okay. This is over time. I stopped this data in 2012 because you couldn't really separate internet and mobile in, uh, anymore. Internet on mobile versus other internet anymore. But if you look at internet diffusion in Asia, this group of companies, uh, countries at the top, Netherlands, Korea, uh, et cetera, are developed countries, right? Can you see the huge gap between developing countries in Asia and developed? Okay, okay, we call that the digital divide. Exactly the same in Africa, same pattern. The industrialized, developed countries have a massive gap when compared with developing African countries. So this is internet diffusion. <clears throat> Look at what happens to global data, users per 100 when we go to mobile. Can you see the difference between developed and developing anymore? You can't, it's what we call convergence. And in fact, this outlier country over here is not a developed con uh, uh, country, it's Vietnam, okay, which is the biggest producer of Samsung phones in the world today. 
And I've taken out Africa and Asia just to show you where something happened, because this is the innovation. Who can think what it is that caused this massive exponential uptick? Because look at this graph, it's flat, and then suddenly, boom, it goes up. What was that innovation, guys? You know it. Just shout it out. Hey? Not smartphones? Not Facebook? It, this uptick means a whole lot more users per 100 people in an economy. Something happened that made this available to a whole lot more people to be able to take it up. But what kind of mobile data? Yes, we forget quickly, hey? Who said that? Prepaid. Remember, only the executives used to be able to have the contracts. For those of you who are in my age group. <laughs> Right? Everybody else couldn't afford it because it was a monthly contract and you usually got it if you were an executive and your company bought it for you. With prepaid, I can buy as I have the money and as I have the need. And it was prepaid that caused this massive uptick in entities. And the same thinking around the life of the poor came to this founder of this company, where a street vendor explained that 300 rupees a month was very expensive. Don't talk to me about that but then went on to say, oh, 10 rupees a day is fine, with the head of the okay? So this mindset shift that when you're innovating, you just change the way you think about a situation and put yourself in the user's shoes. And this, this company has a joke, which is about the David and Goliath story. They joke that they started in the same year as Lehman Brothers, but they still exist. So there are sustainable business models here. They also talk about this beautiful concept of the zebra versus the unicorn. In South Africa, we're obsessed with a black industrialist program. We think if we throw money at a business, it turns it into a unicorn. What we're actually missing is a big funnel of solid mom and pop stores that are paying tax, that are off the social grant, that are living a dignified life, and that are giving five to six people in their community a quality job. Can we start to build more of these? Some more innovation. All of our ESCOM drama, still business day, front story, ESCOM drama, coal, coal, coal. 13th biggest producer of carbon in the world. How embarrassing. In Copa, in uh, in Kenya, took these little kits and used the prepaid airtime concept. So you could put the solar panel up at your house, and every time you needed power, you do an SMS payment on M-Pesa, and you unlock solar power for however long you need it. And a portion of that payment goes towards the capital repayment on this, and eventually you own it. But while you're saving to own it, you're able to use the technology in incremental packages, changing the lives of many, many rural people and businesses. So, summarized today, innovation has to occur on multiple fronts, guys. If we want to create these jobs, if we want to grow our businesses in very tough economic climate, government ain't going to do it for us. It's about thinking business model, not product. It's about the how and not the what. It's not just about being a trader in South Africa. It's not being about a smos. How much do I buy and sell for? It's thinking distribution, education, building local relationships, building new partnerships, and building local incomes. Because who is your future customer if 67% of our youth are not in employment? Think frugally. We've got to innovate very differently from the West. We're in a different economic context. And there are beautiful examples globally of companies, doctors, that are engineering high-quality, low-cost services and goods. This guy over here was a successful surgeon in London at Guy's Hospital, was asked to treat Mother Teresa, decided to change his life, go back to India, and make uh, cardiac surgery affordable. 
He does quality cardiac surgery, doctor, for $800. And I could say, look, I could, I'm an ex-dentist. I could give a try at cardiac surgery for $800, but I'm not sure you'd live. They have better post-operative results than the best US clinics, and that was a Harvard study that compared. In fact, people from the UK and the US started flying to India to have surgery at his clinics, Narayana Health. So if you can engineer a human life and add that quality into an economy, we can't complain about not being able to do it with widgets. This is just an example of, of GE. So the answer, people, is small business. And yes, we believe we're not going to solve our economic problems or our unemployment problem without thinking small business. They're intimately locked together. We grow small business, we grow employment opportunities. Here it is. It was very late in the deck. 1% of firms in Europe are over 250 employee, uh, employees, and 91% of firms in Europe are 1 to 8 employees. Having a developed economy is led by small business. Enabling infrastructure, capabilities, business creation means local jobs, building local economies, and creating community role models. This was Mozambique, the most impoverished regions of Mozambique. This technology, Ampu unit, these farmers had never seen cash in their lives until SAB in partnership bought this Ampu unit that could convert their cassava crop into extrude. This is Kenya. Here they bundled seed and fertilizer with insurance. These farmers, for the first time ever, became insured. You know what it's like in these developing economies? A season of drought, the entire village shuts down. So bringing financial services paid over mobile phone, paid out over mobile phone with satellite technology. There's cool stuff happening out there. There's massive opportunity in serving the underserved. Even these farmers in the Great Rift Valley get paid out on M-Pesa on their phones. You don't have to send a fax from this valley that your crop failed the satellite technology and these um, meteorological society polls help you do that. So here, this is my fi uh, second, second last slide. Our most prosperous modern societies are wiser. Okay. Not because citizens are individually brilliant. There's no lone genius answer for us. They're prosperous because they hold a diversity of know-how and they recombine it to create a larger variety of smarter and better products. There's a very clever man, Ricardo Hausman. He's done a lot of research on what makes a country rich. And it's about connections. It's about getting out of your silo. And it's about what is happening here today. This kind of knowledge sharing, networking, this is where ideas happen. This is some work my husband has done, looking at economic growth and company earnings. Can you see the correlation globally? So this is across the world. The correlation between country GDP, which is the gray bar, and company earnings. What do you notice? Okay. It fluctuates, but it's... GDP goes up. Company earnings go up. GDP goes down, company earnings go down. These are South Africa's numbers. Very high correlation. Can you see that? What does this mean, guys? This means if our country doesn't do well, our companies don't do well. No country, no company. So help us build, yes. Help us be creative and innovative in the ways that we create jobs. And let us tell your stories. Thank you. Jashmi, thank you so very, very much. We, we have no time for questions.